Jesus, praise Jesus, come on!
Jesus, have your way, have your way in us. We give you our hearts in worship today. Lord, we pray that today, come, oh God, and do a new work in our lives that we may fully surrender to you. And Lord, trust in you that your word is true, your promises are true, and that God, if we come and honour you and trust in you and walk with you, you, our word says that we will live. We will find eternal life. Lord, you are blessing and your grace, your mercy will be upon us. So God, renew our minds today. Draw us closer to you. Lord, we do not want to stand afar, but we want to stand right there to hear your word like Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. So today, oh God, bless us and help us. Lord, take away physical tiredness from our body. We also pray for those who are still on the way here. Grant them journey mercy. Lord, that may everyone who turns their heart towards you, Lord, will find you today. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated down. Thank you. Amen. Well, it's very good to uh, see you all again. I think after a while, we kind of all got used to uh, this timing and coming to this place. Um, I just want to make a, some quick announcement that um, I think we, we are releasing our registration on an evening, on Thursday evening. If, if everyone is okay with that, then we will keep it to Thursday 8 p.m. But the, um, the, the amount of time, okay, is almost like three, four minutes and everything will be taken already. So I have, um, if I have someone texting me and say, Pastor, I went in to try to register at 10 p.m. and the seats are taken. We are not talking about one hour, two hours gap. We're just talking about five minutes and all seats were taken. So if you really want to come, you do have to uh, be ready at about 8 p.m. Uh, but of course, we do have other thoughts in our minds about how we want to take this forward because then it becomes fastest finger, right? So it may not be the best uh, way to do this. We will be thinking, we will be talking to some people and then we see how best we can do this. Of course, uh, Emmanuel Assembly of God is also trying to uh, apply for uh, this space to be used for 150 uh, participants, okay, for the service. So we are waiting for them to get the approval and then maybe that will help us a little bit as well. All right, then the other thing I want to say is that when you register, try to register your full, not your full name as in um, so that we can call you if there is any adjustments, okay? Don't just give us a surname like Tan and it, we, won't, we won't know who actually is the person. All right, now there are two announcements I have before we go to the Word. I just want to highlight to you that uh, Singapore Bible College, right, they have this course called the, the Certificate of Church Ministry. It's not a three credit or full credit course. It's just a certificate. You only need to do six modules. Each module um, is only 16 hours. So it can actually be broken up into four Saturdays, four Saturdays and four hours from nine to one. And that means, in other words, that's one module, okay? So from nine to one, one module, you can finish. You only need to finish six modules and then you can get this certificate of uh, church ministry. Um, this year, the registration closes at, on the 26th of December. There are very uh, interesting causes because there are causes like um, uh, eschatology, there is a course which is the study of end times. There is a course called Taking Another Look at Mark chapter 13. Mark chapter 13 is where um, Jesus speaks about uh, the, the natural disasters, uh, Earthquakes, war, famine, pestilences, which is the equivalent of Matthew chapter 24. Then there is also a course on lay preachers' training. There is one on creative teaching in a digital space. Now, uh, then there's one on crisis counselling. So now there are these six courses. Um, this semester is this particular, this, uh, these six courses. Next semester, they will introduce six more modules. So you actually can choose whichever module you want. Um, if you feel that this semester you only like one module, then you just try. Uh, the cost fee is $171 with a one-time application fee of $21.40. I think it's worth trying, like 
go for one module, see how you feel about you know, studying again. I always believe in lifelong learning. Uh, but, and this is not heavy on um, assignments because it's not a credit course. It's just a certificate. It's for you to get yourself exposed. So you, I will, what I'll do is I'm going to give more information on our announcement group chat on, on WeChat, okay, so that you can go in and look at it. All right? The other thing I want to say, uh, this announcement, is it pertains to last weekend we had our winter clothing collection. Uh, I just want to tell you that we, we, you, we did very well, okay? as in like we really collected about 200 kilograms of worth of winter jackets and thermal wear, but we can only ship about 85 kilograms worth of thermal clothes to Grace Educare. So Grace Educare is this Christian orphanage in, um, near the Golden Triangle, so it's actually in Myanmar. And we actually got to know of this Grace Educare through Brother Samuel Kwan because he has been there before and he's also now still teaching uh, the children over there violin over Zoom, okay? And many of these children, their parents are either they have passed away or they are incarcerated in prison due to drugs. And uh, many of these children are also exploited by the criminal organization over there as to be drug mules. So one of the reasons why we are giving them winter clothes is because they have already started winter. Uh, it will last all the way to February, but many of them do not have enough um, winter clothes. So we, we also want to just specially thank um, Jane, uh, Jane because she, uh, she helped us in many ways, okay? Because she was a Thai missionary for 10 years, so she can speak fluent Thai. And then she actually helped us to negotiate the to uh, you know negotiate in, in Thai and send the staff to Chiang Rai so that they can en route it to Myanmar. And then we actually save a lot on the freight charges because most of the uh, the people are now charging double because of COVID. And then also because uh, Jane went to find her friends from zero waste community uh, in Singapore and she made multiple trips to collect many of these very very uh, good quality winter clothes uh, to, to send to these children. So I just want to thank everyone. So it's really like what the Bible says, that the church is like a body. Everyone, every joint supplies. Uh, Samuel Kwan came, told everyone that there was this particular need. We make an announcement and everyone chipped in and, and we did a great job. So I just want to thank everyone uh, for doing this. All right, praise the Lord. Now today, I just uh, we want to go on to uh, the... Book of Deuteronomy, if you can open up your Bibles, and I encourage you, I've been encouraging you to bring along a physical Bible because that will really help a, a lot, okay, in terms of finding the Scripture and seeing the uh, parallelism and comparisons in the Scripture. All right, so I'm giving myself as much time as possible so that we can end the service about 8.30, yeah, like what we, we hope to do every week. All right, so let's just look to the Lord uh, again and just say a, a short prayer. Dear Jesus, I just pray that today, as we hear your word, may you give us a creative mind to see your scripture and to also be able to understand uh, the truth that is in it. Open up our eyes, our spiritual eyes to see and our hearts, O oh God, to receive and to obey your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today, I titled my message called Love the Lord with All Your Heart. Because I think this is a key verse in Deuteronomy. You know where we, uh, in the Gospels, you hear Jesus always say, uh, I mean, someone testing Jesus and say, what is the greatest commandment? And then he says, you are to love the Lord your God with all your heart. Um, that is found in Leviticus, but it's also found in Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, there is a particular verse that um, all Jews would know and they recite it every day. It's called the Shema, which is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. So this, this, this is the reason why I, I think the first lesson, I want to title it as to love God with all our heart. But what actually does that mean? I think then later on, I will share in my sermon and I'll be leading you in that direction to think about what does it mean to love God with all your heart. So i just do a bit of a recap. Uh, where are we at in Deuteronomy? Uh, if we look at the Pentateuch, the five books of Moses, as one book but five parts. And that's what I've been trying to share with you 
since I think April this year. So now we are at the 40th year. Uh, Miriam has died. Uh, I've shown you from the Numbers 20 and verse 1. So when did Miriam, Moses' sister, die? She, uh, die? she died on the first month of the 40th year. And then in Numbers chapter 33 and verse 38, we saw that Aaron, uh, Moses' brother, also died on the fifth month of the 40th year. So uh, last time when we were in Numbers, we saw the second census. Okay, The second census are for the second generation of the Israelites in the wilderness because the first generation has passed away. So we are now on the, at the 40th year. We are at the plains of Moab. Uh, where they are just at the fringe of the promised land. And what is key is also last, the last time we came together, we saw that they had defeated two kings, Sihon, the king of Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. And I think that it's important for me to mention because I, I, I told you that in the Old Testament, you keep seeing the mention of these two particular kings. I think that I personally think that the significance of it is that God is giving Israel a foretaste of victory. In other words, this is before they enter into Canaan, Canaan proper. Okay, but so, Ok and Sihon, these two kings are at the eastern side of the River Jordan. Okay, so from your perspective, if the River Jordan comes down like this, the Promised Land is on the western part. Now, these two kings that I'm talking about is on the east side of the River Jordan. So, they already have victory as a foretaste to give them confidence to let them see that God is with them and that their conquest of Canaan is imminent and it is going to happen okay so I just also want to show you that and in today's lesson right to, to also show you that uh, we can see the Pentateuch or we can see Deuteronomy in the Gospels and of course eventually in the book of Acts what do I mean by that I think in the Gospels, you see a little bit of the victory, okay? When Jesus sends out the disciples two by two, right? And then they came back saying, um, the, 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 the sick were healed. Demons were cast out in Jesus' name. And then Jesus rejoiced and Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Okay, so that is like a foretaste of the victory that the apostles and the followers of Jesus are going to have. We, but we only see them really preaching the gospel and spreading the gospel only in the book of Acts. Do you understand what I'm saying? After the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, so in that sense, you see, in the book of Acts, it says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So that is where the gospel was headed. It's almost like you can think uh, of the book of Acts and it's like the conquest of Canaan. But that was only in the book of Acts. So in the Gospels, we see an initial victory. Can you, you understand what I'm saying? So I want you to understand and see parallelism like this because that will help you to understand why the Bible says that what happened to Israel in the Old Testament is an instruction or an example for us in the New Testament. Okay, and so today I also want to show you how Jesus is like a new Moses. What do I mean by that? That means, see, Moses was the one who led them out of Egypt through the Red Sea. It's called an exodus, correct? I want you to see later on that Jesus was also like the new Moses who brings us out of a new exodus, out of slavery, out of slavery of sin into God's um, promises or promised land. So, but who is the one ultimately that brought Israel into Canaan? It was Joshua. It's not Moses. So you also can see that Jesus is the new Joshua. Okay, so in terms of understanding the Bible, we don't be so uh, fixed. Oh, Jesus is Moses, so he cannot be Joshua. No. Everyone in the Bible, every character is fulfilled completely in Jesus Christ. So you're later going to see how Jesus is also like the Joshua, the new Joshua that brings us truly into God's rest. All right, and what does that mean? What is God's rest? So that's later on. Okay, so I just give you a, a brief summary. First of all, let's look at the overview of the structure uh, of Deuteronomy. First of all, I want to say Deuteronomy is uh, this phrase, uh, this the name of this book, 
is in Greek is Deuteronomio, which means second law. And how do I how do you know that? Because Deuteros is second, and nomos is law. So second law. Uh, nomos. How do you remember nomos is law? Because every time you think of the word antinomianism, that means anti-law. Nomos. Okay. Now, uh, but this title is confusing because it is not. Uh, the original Hebrew title is not second law. The original Hebrew title is the very first word of the book of Deuteronomy. These are the words. That's the original Hebrew title. But when the, um, uh, in the time of Alexander the Great, we, they, she, he had a major empire. That is where you had the Greek culture. This was before Jesus came into the scene. Okay, So in the Greek culture, they translated the Old Testament into Greek. And they, that's called the LXX, the Septuagint. So the, 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 in that translation from the Old Testament, which is written in Hebrew into Greek, the name of Deuteronomy came about. You know, so in Greek, and, and it's a misunderstanding because uh, the translators felt that this was the second time uh, the law was given or the a, a repetition of the law, okay? So that's what it meant. But it's okay, it's this, since it's already like this, i just give you a background. The characteristic of this book is quite interesting because it is one of the most, Deuteronomy is one of the most influential books in the Old Testament. Uh, because many of the prophets, later on, next time, in the coming years when we study the prophets, you'll find that many of the prophets quoted from Deuteronomy. In fact, in uh, it is one of the Old Testament books most quoted even in the New Testament. Okay? There are at least 49 quotations and it is exceeded only by two other books, Psalms and Isaiah. So if you say what are the top three books in the Old Testament that is often quoted by the New Testament writers, you have Psalms, Isaiah and Deuteronomy. Of the 27 New Testament writings, 11 of them quoted from Deuteronomy. So it's a very important book. It has a lot of uh, significance and we will try our best to see uh, some of these uh, significance. Okay? Now, uh, the other structure I want to show you is a chart. Um, I know that the words are not that big, but, I, but that's why we give, you, give the P PDF to you on, the, on your WhatsApp group chat. I just want to highlight main thing is that you see uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 5 is a heading. And then, key things to take note of, there are three sermons. First sermon, second sermon, third sermon, and then you have the epilogue, which is uh, a description of Moses' last days. So and then that completes the Pentateuch. There are some Bible scholars that even believe that everything is, that is uh, narrated in Deuteronomy happened in one day. It's almost like the day that Moses knew he was going to die, he said everything to the second generation in the form of sermons, in the form of explaining the law, explaining the journey out of Egypt, how they came, how they came to Mount Sinai, why it took 40 years for them before they now can have a chance to go into Canaan because their forefathers or their parents' generation had no faith. And then they were defeated and they had to camp in Kadesh Barnea. Remember the story of the 12 spies, right? 10 came back with a bad report. So that's the reason why Deuteronomy, um, uh, that's why scholars think that that's like the last words that Moses has for the, uh, the second generation. But let's just, so let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 1 and verse 1 to 5. I think it's important for us to see this. He said, these are the words that Moses spoke to all Israel beyond the Jordan in the wilderness, in the Arabah. Okay, let's look at verse 2. Uh, it is 11 days' journey from Horeb by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. So you see, it's quite clear that where is, we are located now, okay, this is now the 40th year, and this is the 11th month. Okay, so that's why earlier on I told you, Miriam died on the first month, Aaron died on the fifth month, and now Moses is going to die. And this is the 11th month. So everything seems to be like quite, 
you know, whatever God says will happen, will happen. This generation will not enter in and they, none of them crossed that 40 years. Okay. Then, of, of course, we got to look at um, verse, verse 4. After he had defeated Sihon, the king of Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Og, the king of Bashan. So I told you again, see, these two kings are mentioned again. And then verse 5, Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law saying. So chapter 1, verse 1 to 5 is like a heading. And so if you want to say, what is the whole entire Deuteronomy about? Verse 5 says, Now at the plains of Moab, Moses undertook to explain the law. Okay, that summarizes the whole book. He is trying to show uh, and explain what has happened, like I say, uh, and how the Israelites are to live their life as they, after they enter the land, and how are they to not only the second generation, but how they are supposed to teach the law to their children and their children's children. Okay, so we will take some time to look into that. All right, so now the question I have is, we have to set this in our modern, sort of like our modern time to make this, this book relevant to us. So the question I have for you is, what would you tell the youths today? So if you are Moses, and now you are going to tell the, speak to the second generation or the young people, and you know that you're going to die, what would you tell them? Okay, so I want to show you a picture. The youths today are a social media generation. Okay. Snapchat, Facebook, WhatsApp, YouTube, you know. All of these things, okay, uh, now TikTok, I, I'm sure in the future there will be something new. I want to show you some uh, stats. If you can look at some of the stats, this is taken from the internet. The time spent with media, okay? These are just for Singapore, and the stats was January 2019. Average daily time spent using internet via any device is 7 hours and 2 minutes daily. You know. That's how much time is spent on the internet by our, our children. The average daily time spent using social media via any device is 2 hours and 8 minutes. So this is the kind of generation, it's all in your, your um, PDF, so we just go quickly. What is the most active social media platform? The next slide is actually YouTube. YouTube is 87, takes out 87%, uh, followed by WhatsApp, then Facebook, Instagram, Facebook Messenger, etc., etc. Okay, you can look at the slides. Social media audience profile, uh, about uh, the peak is the 20, uh, people age, ages between 25 to 34, that's the peak, and then 35 to 44, and then so on and so forth. So nowadays, if you have uh, an app, I think if you use an Apple phone, they will actually tell you this week how much time you spend on social media. Okay, so what kind of, a, what kind of generation uh, use? They are a social media generation. Just want to ask you, what then would you tell them if you are Moses? All right, so let's, let's continue. Is there any more slides on this? No, I don't think so, right? Okay, what's the next slide? Okay, Deuteronomy, all right. So after knowing the structure and the Deut and, and of Deuteronomy, and that New Deuteronomy is the most quoted book in the New Testament, how do we want to read this book? There are many, many different ways of reading this book, okay? But what I want to focus on this few weeks that I have is to see in the light of Jesus as the new Moses, like I share with you, and to see Jesus like the new Joshua who would bring God's people into rest. And then in the subsequent weeks, we are going to spend more time just delving into the concept of the kingdom of God. And what does that mean? Because when Israel enters into Canaan, they are now a nation. They're going to take over this land. They're going to divide it by the, into the 12 tribes. And there's a certain way of life. So we want to look at what is the way of life and what is God trying to do to have a unique nation, a kingdom of God here on earth where God rules as king in their midst. And I think that is a good pattern for us in the New Testament as the new Israel, how we as a church, we should be learning from the principles that are actually found in Deuteronomy, how we should conduct ourselves.
So one of the hardest things for me uh, is to organize so many thoughts about the Bible into a coherent structure and in point form. Because I want to tell you that the Bible is not written in point form. It's written as a narrative. It's written as a story. So I'm trying to pick out some of these uh, points to help us to actually see the story. Okay, I'll try my best. Right. Now, so we want to go through Deuteronomy chapter 1 to 10 today just to see some of these things. Number one, we are going to look at Moses and Joshua. If you look at Deuteronomy 1 verse 34, uh, verse 34 all the way to 40. Okay, bear in mind, uh, I'm looking at Jesus as the new Moses and Jesus as the new Joshua. And the Lord heard your words and was angered. This is Moses saying to the people. Not one of, the, one of these men of this evil generation shall see the good land that I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, the son of Japheneh. He shall see it, and to him and to his children I will give the land on which he has trodden, because he has wholly followed the Lord. Even with me, the Lord was angry on your account and said, You also shall not go in there. Who is this person? Moses. Moses also shall not go in. Joshua, the son of Nun, who stands before you, he shall enter. Encourage him, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. So Caleb and Joshua are the only two spies that wholly followed the Lord. And now God is telling Moses to encourage Joshua because what, 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 what does the Bible say? For he shall cause Israel to inherit it. Who will cause Israel to inherit it? Joshua. Okay? And last time we, we, we read in, the, in Numbers, I already told you that Joshua's Hebrew name is Jehoshua and Jesus' Hebrew name is Yeshua. Or, you understand? Yehoshua and Yeshua. So they're actually the same name. All right? So if you look at another passage in Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23, again Moses was recounting how God forbade him. That means God says, Moses, you will not enter in verse 23, chapter 3. And I pleaded with the Lord at that time saying, O oh Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? Please let me go over and see the good land beyond the Jordan, that good hill country and Lebanon. This is Moses pleading with God, please, please let me go. Verse 26, but the Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. And the Lord said to me, enough from you. Wow, can you imagine God telling us, okay, stop, gao liao. Yeah. enough. Do not speak to me of this matter again. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift up your eyes westward and northward and southward and eastward and look at it with your eyes for you shall not go over this Jordan. So it's very clear, you shall not go. But, watch, charge Joshua and encourage and strengthen him for he shall go over at the head of these people and he shall put them in possession of the land that you shall see. I think that this is prophetic. Right at the time, this is probably written in 1405 BC. Okay? And God is telling Moses, enough! I don't want to hear this anymore from you because I want you to encourage Yeshua. He will be the one that will bring the people into possession. So, what does this remind you of? Can you tell me another time that Moses and Yeshua stood together on a mountain in the New Testament. I'm sure you can think of the Mount of Transfiguration, right? The Mount of Transfiguration. So in Luke chapter 9, verse 29 to 31, now it gives you a little bit of a clue why Moses appeared. Huh? Are you with me? You see, and he was, as he was praying, this is Jesus, okay, and as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him. Who was talking to Jesus? Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure. This is the, this is the ESV version, and the ESV version used the word departure. The NKJV Use the, the, the word de, the demise, his decease. Speaking about how Jesus was going to die in Jerusalem. 
But I want you to see the original Greek word. Even though you don't read Greek, right? But when you see that word over there, it, 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 the, the character reminds you of something, isn't it? E-X-O-D-O-S. What's that? Exodus. So the Greek writer Luke is trying to show us something here. Moses is coming to speak to Jesus, to talk to him about his exodus, which he will accomplish at Jerusalem. So when Jesus dies on the cross, he is actually bringing about a new exodus for the people of God. So he is like the new Joshua. He is also like the new Moses. That's how we look at the Scripture. That's how we see the relevance of Deuteronomy and the New Testament. Are you with me? Okay, so let's go back to Deuteronomy chapter 1 again. We haven't finished the verse, okay? We just read to you the part where God told Moses, encourage Joshua, for he shall cause Israel to inherit it. I'm at chapter 1, verse 39, Deuteronomy. And as for your little ones, who you said would become a prey and your children who today have no knowledge of good or evil, they shall go in there, and to them I will give it, and they shall possess it. Who is going to go in? Let me read to you one more time, verse 39. The little ones who you said would become a prey. Who is the you? The first generation, the parents. Because when the 12 spies went out and then they came back, they said there were giants in the land, and we are not able to take it. In fact, what's going to happen is our children will die. So Moses says, you, you who say that your children will die, okay? These children who today have no knowledge of good and evil. Wait a minute. Why this phrase, good, knowledge of good and evil? If I tell you this phrase, knowledge of good and evil, what will you think of? Genesis. You straight away think of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So there is a comparison here now. Who dies and who is going to go in? The children who do not know good and evil is going to live. That represents a tree of life, isn't it? The first generation that is so clever, that disobey God's word, that cannot believe in God's word, is as if they are those who partake of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you see? So you see already there, Genesis and Deuteronomy has certain parallelism. Okay, so I just wrote over there on, uh, in the slide so you make it easy for everyone to understand. So, this, so the disobedience, if, we, if I look at it as the first generation, they are those who seemingly have acquired from the tree of knowledge of good and evil by not believing and by not trusting in God's word like the ten spies and like the first generation of children of Israel that passed away. Then, partaking of the tree of life, because they will live, they will enter in. God says they will enter Canaan. Are those who trust in God's word and two, two spies, Joshua and Caleb, who wholly follow the Lord. It speaks of... So if I today want to ask you to, to do a Bible study on what is the tree of knowledge of good and evil and what is the tree of life, at least now you have an imagery of two generations, one, wonder, one perish in the wilderness and the other went in. And what do you mean by partaking of the tree of life? It means you trust in God's word and you wholly follow the Lord. And what does it mean to partake of the tree of knowledge and good and evil that caused you to die? God, God told Adam, the day you eat of this fruit or this tree, you will surely die. It's not trusting in God's word. No. Then let's look at one more thing. What about the concept of rest? You know, in Hebrews, it does talk about how there remains a day of rest and that Joshua did not really bring them into a day of rest. You know, this rest thing, what, what actually is, is the Bible um, referring to? Okay, so let's, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 12 and then we want to look at Genesis as well, okay, so that we can have a a, another imagery on how we understand rest. Deuteronomy chapter 12 and verse 1 to 10, and that's where we'll be looking at. The title of this chapter is The Lord's Chosen Place of Worship. 
Now, they haven't entered Canaan, correct? But later on, much later on, we know the chosen place of worship is Jerusalem because later on Solomon built the temple. So this again is a prophetic word into the future. Moses telling the children of Israel, one day you will come into Canaan and then you will find a place that God would choose for himself and where his habitation, his dwelling place will be. So that's where we are at, okay? So verse 1. These are the statutes and rules that you shall be careful to do in the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, has given you to possess. All the days that you live on the earth, you shall surely destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispose uh, serve their gods on the high mountains and on the hills and under every green tree. You shall tear down their altars and dash in pieces their pillars and burn their asherims with fire. You shall chop down the carved images of their gods and destroy their name uh, and destroy their name out of that place. So God is saying, when I send Israel into Canaan, it is for them to clear out all the idolatries and all the um, carved images in the land. God wants to clean the land. The land will become a holy land that is set apart for God. Verse 5, But you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of all your tribes to put His name and make His habitation there. You see, very clear. God is going to seek a place and, and uh, make His habitation there. There you shall go and do what? And there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and your contributions that you present, your vow offerings, your free will offerings and the firstborn of your herd and of your flock. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God and you shall rejoice. Pay attention to the word eat and rejoice, okay? Then, uh, uh, and the Bible says, and all that you undertake in which the Lord your God has blessed you. Verse 8, you shall not do according to all that we are doing here today, everyone, everyone doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For you have not as yet come to the rest, you see the word there, and to the inheritance that the Lord your God is giving you. But when you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and when He gives you rest from all your enemies around so that you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make His name dwell there, there you shall bring all that I command you. So I put on the slide to help you to see what are some of the key things that we have read today, okay, uh, in chapter 12. We have seen that rest is actually uh, over here described as rest from enemies and that they will live in safety. Rest is also a land where you shall eat and rejoice before the Lord. Rest is also a place to put God's name and make His habitation there. So what am I trying to say? And I read this, when I read this, I think of the Garden of Eden. Because the Garden of Eden is the place where God has prepared all the fruits, the trees, that is good for food. It is the place of God's habitation. You remember God was walking in the cool of the day in the Garden of Eden? Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you think of rest, then you think of the word in Genesis where God says He worked six days and on the seventh day He rested from His work. So I want you to see this parallelism, okay? And that is, when God brings Israel into Canaan, He is wanting Canaan to become like a new Eden. Very important, okay? Canaan is to be like a new Eden. It's the restoration of what has uh, been destroyed or what has uh, uh, been marked by sin. Because Adam sinned and he was driven out of Eden. So now God has chosen Abraham and from Abraham chosen a nation and now leads this nation into Canaan to give them a set of laws so that he can dwell with them and make Canaan a new Eden again. That is what I want you to see. So this is another allusion to Genesis when we look at the scripture this way. Now, i show you another verse, which is uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. You see, the earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering, rachap, over the face of the waters. This word, hovering, was not mentioned anywhere else in the Old Testament except in Deuteronomy, which is why I want to highlight to you. 
And Deuteronomy 32, verse 9 to 11, you see this word. But the Lord's portion is his people, Jacob, his allotted heritage. He found him in the desert land and in the howling ways of the wilderness. He encircled him. He cared for him. He kept him as the apple of his eye, like an eagle that stirs up his nest, that flutters. Rachab. That's the, that's the same word. Over its young, spreading out its wings, catching them, bearing them on its pinions. So you see God's imagery of Israel, His salvation of Israel, He's taking care of them. It's like Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. And then God said, let there be light, and there was light. So what am I trying to show you is that you, read, you can read Genesis to understand Deuteronomy. You can read Deuteronomy to try to understand Genesis. So there are scholars who do not really read Genesis 1 and 2 as a literal uh, account of creation, but reading it as a summary, as a po poetry of Israel, as a nation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So when you think of Adam and Eve, okay, whether you think of them as a historical Adam and Eve or you think of them as actually God's creation, how God forms Israel out of nothing, out of the dust of the ground, how God chose them and breathed to them His Holy Spirit and they became a nation. And God puts them in Eden where He dwells. And now you see Deuteronomy and, and Gen Genesis coming together. And, and after you understand it this way, right, your mind can be exploding and sparks and igniting with great imageries of the Bible. That's why the Bible is not boring. You just need to understand how it's written. And then you will get a lot, a lot from it. All right? So thus, we can draw this link, okay, that I'm trying to share with you, that Genesis and Exodus uh, and the whole Pentateuch is, is read as one book. And going to Canaan is God establishing His habitation like a Garden of Eden again. In fact, if you, if you understand this, then next time when we have a chance to read uh, the book of Revelation, right, the Revelation of Jesus Christ, then you will also see why at the end of Revelation, uh, the imagery is actually that of like an Eden, a new heaven and new earth where the tree of life is over there. So, if I want to just keep it simple, where is Eden and what is Eden? Eden is actually a place where God dwells. So, if I ask you today, where does God dwell? What does Paul say? Paul told the Corinthians, do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit? You is plural. That means collectively as a church, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God dwells here with us. So why do we keep our lives pure? Why do we actually think about holiness and wanting to be pure before God? It's because we want God to dwell here with us. And this is like a new Eden, a new heaven, a new earth. All right, then one more thing. Let's go on to, the, to, to this part. Hearing the word, okay, hearing the word. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 4. And I want you to see verse 1 to 2. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and the clock, right? You always say. Verse 1, And now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and rules that I'm teaching you. Watch, huh? Listen. Who is speaking? Moses is speaking. Listen to the statutes and the rules that I am teaching you. Who is the I? Moses. And then he says, And do them that you may live. And go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. Do you know why the Pharisees are so against Jesus? And the Jews are so, um, how do I say, they cannot accept Christ is because they keep wanting to go back to the laws of Moses. Because over here is very clear. Moses says, listen to what I teach you so that you will live. So you are if you don't listen to Moses, then you are saying you are choosing death. Do you understand what I'm saying now? This is a very serious 
word, you know. Every word, every word is important. Every word is life. So how do you deal with this matter, you see? That's why I say in the New Testament, Jesus is the new Moses. Because look at Matthew chapter 17, verse 45. Earlier on, I told you about the Mount of Transfiguration, right? Moses coming and speaking with Jesus. So think of it as Moses telling Jesus, encouraging him and, and telling him that, yes, you are the one that will lead God's people into the new exodus, into rest, okay? But, but look at what Peter says. Peter said to Jesus, chapter 17, verse 4 to 5, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here. One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. In the mind of Peter, Jesus, Moses, Elijah are like equal. But I want you to see what the Lord says. I mean, what, what God the Father says. He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Now watch. Listen to Him. Very significant that we don't see in the Mount of Transfiguration. God, the Father, is telling Peter, the disciples, and all the, the three of them, Peter, James, and John, who were in the Mount of Transfiguration, I want you to listen to this Jesus. He will be the one, not the laws of Moses. Do you understand what I'm saying? So that's why John 6, 63, you see Jesus make a statement himself. It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is, of, is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Jesus says, you want to live? You listen to my words. Peter responds, John 6, 68. Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So if the Jews in the Old Testament will listen to Moses and treat it so seriously that they must hear Moses' words because to hear, they will live. Then let me ask you this question. And let me ask all the young people here. Do you treat the, Lord, the words of Jesus the way the Jews treat the words of Moses? Do you believe that when you hear the words of Jesus, you will live the eternal life? Like what Peter says, you have the words of eternal life. Eternal life comes from hearing God's word through His Son, Jesus Christ. You know, when I was young, I didn't know all these things. Every sermon that I preached this year is a new sermon. I've never shared all this before because I didn't know all these things. But I remember when I was young, I, was, I got saved when I was 16 years old, in sec 4. Secondary 1, I was in Victoria Junior College. I was so hungry for God's word. Many times during the recess time, I would go to the squash courts and I would pluck in my Walkman in those days with cassette tape and I'll be listening to God's word and I'll be writing down notes. If I want to share with the young people today, what is it that I want to say? You know, many people say, the young people need to have a role model. But we try to role model for them many, many things. How to be a successful entrepreneur, how to be a, a social media influencer, you know, all those things. But who is modeling for them to love God's Word, to read, to study, to love it with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength? Because that's where life is. When you say to love God with all your heart, what are you saying? It is not a romantic kind of love, you know. When we sing, I love you, I love you, I love you. I, what is in your mind? Maybe your mind is like a romantic relationship between a man and a woman, that kind of love. But I want to tell you that when you think of the word love in the Bible, it's always about loving God's word. It's really, it's really about a love that you can obey. A love that involves hearing His word and obeying. So next time when you sing, I love you, I love you, I love you, you are actually, you make sure you are actually telling God, I want to know your word and I want to obey. Because that is what this love is about. So Deuteronomy is showing us the value of God's word, but we don't always value it, isn't it? In fact, many of us, you know, we, we, we say we love God, but what is love? Love in Hebrew is this word, ahav. Love the Lord, ahav. Ahav, okay, in the Pentateuch, just in the Pentateuch. 
is mentioned 22 times in Deuteronomy, 14 times in Genesis, 2 times in Exodus, and 2 times in Leviticus, which shows you that 55% of the time is found in Deuteronomy. So that's why I titled today's message to love the Lord your God. Love in Deuteronomy here is really more a love relationship between a father and a son. So that's why I draw a a separation or a distinction between the love of a man and woman. It's more like the love of a father and son. The more like the father's instruction to the son and the son obeys, just like Proverbs. So when you can understand this, then when you read Proverbs, you understand why Proverbs chapter 1 to 9 talks so much about father's son. My son, hear my instruction. My son, fear the Lord. You understand? So love here is not just an emotional love, but it is an obligatory kind of love. That means it has to do with a love that can be commanded, a love that can be demonstrated in obedience and loyalty and service. It's a love that is defined within a covenant, ahav. So I want to show you some scriptures to show you that this is what it is. And all these scriptures are only taken from Deuteronomy. Look at Deuteronomy 5 verse 10. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. So when you say you love God, you're like a son saying, I will listen to my father. I will honor my father. I will believe his word and I will obey his word. Deuteronomy 7 verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay? to a thousand generations. Deuteronomy 11, one, 1 says, You shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep His charge, His statutes, His rules, and His commandments always. Deuteronomy 11, 13, And if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love the Lord your God and to serve Him with all your heart and with all your soul. So it's different ways of saying the same thing. Deuteronomy 11, 22 says, For if you will carefully to do You'll be careful to do all these commandments that I command you to do, loving the Lord your God, walking in all His ways, and holding fast to Him. Love is demonstrated by obedience. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. So don't just have a romantic love in your mind when you worship God. You must look at the scripture and understand what does it mean, okay, to be a new Israel, to be the church, to be the kingdom of God here on earth. Okay, let's love the word of God. Amen. Amen. Okay, so I, I'm trying to encourage as many of you to go and study, pursue some form of theological education because you are allowing yourself to once again the spark, okay, to, to fan the flame, to allow yourself to love God's word again. Amen. So, you know the Israelites are a covenant people of God. So, you, you saw how in Numbers, right, they, the first generation did not uh, please God because they refused to obey His commandments. Then the second generation are no better because they also was rebellious. Uh, then, so, what is God then going to do? So I say that they are covenant people, but how are they a covenant people? They are covenant people by the sign of circumcision. Okay, that's what the Bible says. So the, the males, all the males, the, they, the, the, they are circumcised on the foreskins of the male organ. But Deuteronomy gives us a hint, okay, on what God was going to do in the coming days. And that is the key today. Okay, Deuteronomy chapter 10 and verse 12 to 16 and with this, I will bring the message to a close. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12. I want you to look at it and see. In verse 12, it says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all His ways, to love Him, you see that? To serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord. So I put it up on the slide for you because I want you to see all five things together. And notice love Him is in the middle. You say you love God, it's to fear Him. You say you love God, it's to walk in all His ways. It's to serve Him with all your heart. It is to keep all His commandments. 
But you know Israel fails, right? They fail again and again. So what's God going to do? Verse 13, 14, <clears throat> and we go on to verse 15. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. So when you think of this phrase, you, God has chosen above all people, you think of the word covenant. This is a covenant people of God. But not just the circumcision of your foreskins. The key is verse 16. Circumcise therefore the foreskins of your heart and be no longer stubborn. The circumcision of the foreskins of the male organ was not sufficient. There must come a circumcision of the heart. And that is where I feel we must cry out to God and ask God through the Holy Spirit, Lord, give us a love for your word. Circumcise our heart. You know, if you, if you, if you love God's word, it's like this. Jesus says you can serve, no man can serve two masters. If you spend all your time pursuing gold because of mon basically money, okay, earning and income, and you, know, you work from night to day, uh, day to night, you won't have time to study the word. It's really like this. It, there is a price to pay. I, 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 you know, I know Jack, my wife, knows how, how I suffer you know, going through lessons. Because I have to start a ministry and pastor, I still have counselling. And I keep, and there, were, there are constant moments for me to tell myself, and first of all, let me tell you, as a leader, it's always easy for me to come out with some reason and excuse to tell you how much I love you and how much the church is so important to me that I don't think I have the time to study and I know you will sure will understand. And if I tell you that I can spend more time with you, then maybe I don't need to study. And all these things are in my mind, you know. Tempting me and telling me, yeah, maybe not really necessary to study. But then I tell myself, no. No. I have to spend the time studying. I must love it and I must lead by example by loving the Word. Then, only then, will you have faith to believe that if you, at what age? I'm coming to 50 years old. At this age, you can still study. And I'm studying and I'm learning and I'm seeing new things that I've never seen before in 30 years of my life. I want to encourage you, see, ask God, circumcise my heart that I can love your word and not the things of this world. It is my heart that is important. So I ask you at the beginning of today's message, what would you tell the young people today? Right? I would say, Tell the young people to love the Lord their God with all their heart, all their soul, all their mind, all their strength. But what does that mean? It is to love His Word. And to love His Word means to hear His Word and to obey His Word. And to do that, you need to know His Word. You need to spend time in this Word. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 10, one last verse. Okay? Deuteronomy 4 verse 10 is where Moses, uh, he's now speaking to the second generation, right? And you know what he said to them? He said, okay, maybe we look at verse 9. Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. So if there's one thing that we need to keep telling the next generation, the next generation as a preacher or as a pastor or whatever, okay, to, as a cell group leader as well, is to keep telling the next generation, love God's word, hear God's word, obey. Now verse 10 says, how on the day that you stood before the Lord, your God at Horeb. I told you before, Horeb is Mount Sinai. And the Lord said to me, gather the people to me that I may let them hear my words so that they may learn to fear me all the days that they, are, that they live on the earth and that they may teach their children so. Okay, who is he talking to? He's talking to the second generation. Actually, it's the second generation, if you think about it, they have been in the wilderness for 40 years. Mount Horeb was where God came down and there was lightning and there was earthquake. It was 40 years pre prior to now. Actually, these children that Moses is talking to, this audience, they actually was not at that 
in the event because many of them were not even born yet. These children were actually, or these people who are standing before Moses now, are born during that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. But why does Moses say in this way, how on the day that you stood before the Lord your God? When I read this, I really, I mean, of course, through reading books and a com- commentary from a theologian, I begin to see that actually every generation must stand before God like as if you are Mount Sinai and hear God's word for yourself. It cannot be that my children say, because my father is a pastor, so I don't need to hear God's word. Moses is saying, you hear God's word as if you were there at the first generation at Mount Sinai, hearing and witnessing the thunderings and the lightnings and the earthquakes. You hear God's word. Every generation. So today, what have I shown you? Jesus is the new Moses leading us into a new exodus. Hear him. That's what the Father says. Hear him. Jesus is the new Joshua, bringing us into rest, restoring us to Eden again, and then bringing us into a place where God can dwell. So Eden, God's habitation. May God circumcise our hearts so that we can hear and obey His voice. This is the verse I want you to meditate on, which we read earlier on. Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God? to walk in all His ways, to love Him, to serve Him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. When I was young as a Christian, I had this worship song. We never really sing in church. I don't know why. Maybe the melody is good for hearing but not very good for singing. But I love it. Every time I hear it, I will cry. And so I want to share this song with you. It's called The The Law of the Lord is Perfect. So we're just here for about two minutes, two and a half minutes as we meditate on this verse, okay? Thank you.
bow our, our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Lord, may you do a work in our hearts to circumcise our heart. That we will, like the song say, treat your word more to be desired than gold. To love your word because it's sweet, sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb. Lord, I pray for this fellowship, this church, that may everyone who you have called to come to this place recognize that this is like a new Eden, a dwelling place, a habitation of the Lord. That, Lord, you have a plan for us. Just like you have a plan for Israel, you have a calling for them, a purpose for them. May we find that purpose and that understanding from your word that we can live a life that is pleasing to you, that you always watch over us. And may not just our generation, but our children and our children's generation hear your word, love your word, fear you, obey your word and your commandments. Help us, O oh God, because we are weak and very often we fail and we disobey you and we are rebellious. But we pray, O oh God, do not forsake us and do not forsake our youth or our, the next generation. But have mercy on us. Show us your hasad, your loving kindness, your steadfast love. Just like you show Israel. So I just pray, O oh God, that in these coming weeks as we study the book of Deuteronomy, may you give us a renewed love for your word. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I hope you are blessed today. You know, um, there's so much of God's word so much. I was always telling um, Jack, my wife, always telling different ones that I meet many, many, many things that I've, I wonder why in my 30 years as a Christian I've never seen before. And so God's Word is, is inexhaustible. It's, I've, never, I've never come to a point where I feel that, hey, I heard before already. No, it's always new. And there's so much life in it. And I'm so blessed studying this Word. I just want to bless you. Shall we all just stand up as we as we just say the Lord's Prayer together, and then I will give you the benediction, and then we can go. Let's all say the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So may the Lord bless you and keep you the Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God our Heavenly Father and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a big hand. God bless you. Amen. So uh, as you exit this place, uh, just the, the usual announcement, like, let's minimize intermingling. And uh, there are two offering boxes behind that you can drop your offering as you go. God bless you. Thank you.